Um, the speaker tonight, Emmanuel Christ and, and Christoph Gantenbein, they started their office about already, I think, 20 years ago in Basel. They both studied at the ETH in Zurich and graduated with uh, under Hans Koloff, if I understand that well, which was somebody that I was looking at a lot at that time when I was finishing my studies myself. Is that correct? Is that finished? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so by now, I think your office is about uh, 40 architects big, designing from smaller residences to big cultural infrastructure and housing all over Europe. I know you, the work of Christian Gantenbein since many years. I remember seeing, maybe the first thing I ever saw were the pictures of the Park Cafe in Basel, a project realized in 2010, so it's not, not very uh, early. It's the outcome of a competition, and the project is a sort of a Gordon Matta Clark cutout into an existing pavilion, creating a large round oculus that connects inside with outside. Like most of their work, it kind of respects and builds upon existing context and the historic heritage, but at the same time completely undermines and questions its DNA by inserting a radical different element into the equation. And that is how I read their work, a work that is completely based on pre-existing conditions, but absolutely refuses to find its design solutions within that given set of rules, vocabulary or grammar. Good examples are the Swiss Church in London or the large museum extensions boat for the Swiss National Museum in Zurich and the Kunstmuseum in Basel. In my office at, at Productora from Mexico, we always have felt a very strong affinity for the work of Christian Gantenbein. And I think that one way or another we form part of the same architectural environment. We have lots of shared friends and colleagues. We have been together in the 2017 Chicago Biennial. We both published a 2G monograph. We both made furniture for the same design gallery in Brussels. You have built work in Mexico and we have built, well, we would really like to work in Switzerland. <laughs> and it is, but although we know, I know your work long, it's not until 2016 that I met Emmanuel when he traveled with his students from Harvard to Los Angeles for a studio called The Art Space in collaboration with the Swiss gallery Hauser and Wirtz that was at that time just installing itself in downtown LA. The studio brief or the introduction to the studio started with a quote from Adolf Loos exploring the differences between a work of art and a work of architecture. In Trotz Dame, Loos says, the aim of a work of art is to make us feel uncomfortable. A building is there for our comfort. A work of art is revolutionary a building is conservative. If that is so, then I'm not sure where Christian Gantenbein's work is situated. Because instead of giving me comfort, the works makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me question the relation, the relations we establish with architectural history and our immediate environment. It plays tricks with what we expect from a building and allows to establish new connections between tradition and technology. Please welcome Emmanuel Christ. Um, thank you very much, Bonnet. I'm, I'm touched. I could have um, gone on listening for another 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, hi everyone. Thank you very, very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Uh, I feel quite a bit of pressure, thanks to that. In, to the invitation and, the, and especially to the introduction, but it's nice. And I hope, um, yeah, what I prepared for you is more or less um, fitting this, uh, this introduction by Vonnet. Okay, that's the name of our, of our office. That's so far so good. And this is a, the maybe not so modest title of my lecture, Ideal Architecture. It's a bit of an experiment. And um, I hope you're ready to follow me. Um, Another thing is that I, I mean, it's very well organized, everything. My visit and, uh, and I spent an hour at the tax office of the UCLA this morning. And, uh, and, and, I, and I signed a contract for a lecture of 45 minutes, actually shorter than the session with the tax officer. Um, 
I try, I try to, to um, comply with that uh, sort of framework, but um, let's see. Yeah. I'm also known as the Fidel Castro of uh, architectural lecturers, so be, be aware. No, but, uh, no, no, I, but I speed up. All right. So, uh, ideal architecture. Uh, why? Very simply, because architecture is not only about building, but also it is about thinking, it is about looking at architecture, especially when we speak in an academic context. It is about um, dreaming of architecture. So in that sense, we could say it is about ideas. And I really, I really believe the architectural project is ultimately about ideas. It's the art of creating ideas, ideas for the city, ideas for buildings, ideas for spaces, spaces for people, of course, for human beings, so ultimately, architecture, at very bottom line, it is creating ideas for life. And therefore, we like to speak of ideal architecture. That's what we currently do in the context of our teaching and working. So and by ideal, we don't necessarily mean especially beautiful or the things we should aspire for, but it's just simply architecture that is based on ideas. And an idea going back to the Greek word, ancient Greek, means sort of a figure or an appearance. And let's say freely um, interpreting, we could speak of images, of course. Images that we're carrying in our mind, that we're producing in our imagination. So this lecture, Ideal Architecture, is about images that we're dealing with, that we're producing while we are designing. And as a short introduction, or first part rather, introduction we've already had, as a, as a first part I would like to show you some pictures. They might ultimately be related to ideas. And it's pictures that Christoph and I, Christoph Gantenbein and I, took on a trip to Italy exactly 20 years ago. So uh, I'm a bit shocked to read that in my notes, but that's a fact. Uh, but the nice thing is, as an architect, you're emerging forever. Uh, so. Um, Okay, but at that time, 1999, we were just out of ETH, our, our university, and we were very much influenced by our teachers at the time. And ETH, I think still, and especially at the time when I was a student in the 90s, history and theory was very strong. And, um, and we had great teachers that were um, telling us about Italian Renaissance and Baroque, and Italy, obviously, <laughs> also for us, always was, has been, and still is a place of desire. And um, so we got a scholarship and we traveled, decided to join the great tradition of the Grand Tour, and we made our own version of the Italian journey. But, and I think this is important, it was not about an academic exercise in architectural history, or something like that. It was much more about our personal new, at the time, contemporary view on architecture. And I would say a contemporary Italian architecture that, that um, also contains, of course, important, important uh, historic buildings. But it was our personal approach or take on architectural history, if you want. And more generally speaking, and this is maybe something that counts for every architect, and has always been the case, it was about finding our own system of reference. It's about our architectural language, you could say, the repertoire, form, language, learning from examples. Very basic, very simple, and still, I think, very successful, at least on a personal level. So that's these slides that you see here, and obviously, you make a plan, you go there, you have the classics, and you find much more than uh, what you're looking for. Later then, we described this, this trip as our first architectural project, and we made even a book out of it, and the title of that work then was Picture from Italy. Uh, on, a very, on a very practical level, this project, Pictures from Italy, meant that we went traveling and taking pictures and traveling and observing in order to discover or even rediscover things, and documenting 
framing an object, an image, a, a, a piece of architecture means probably already a first act of design or at least appropriation. And finally, by editing these pictures or by selecting them already, you are interpreting, you are giving your own reading of architecture. And without false modesty, we could say this is a first act of design. And um, uh, what I now try to do is to show you a, a couple of these pictures. There were 1,200 of them. Um, it was hard to make a selection, but I show you not all of them, unfortunately, but this is a, a very famous um, uh, palazzo. It's called Palazzo Te by Giulio Romano in Mantua. And what is interesting, it's a very, probably you know that, I don't know, I have not, not much ideas about your school, so forgive me uh, if I'm, but I mean, this is a classic. It's a square plan, a big courtyard. So a very rational, almost schematic type of a palazzo. And in contrast to the typological rigor, um, you see these very rich and complex facades. And what you can see, and I don't want to go too much into detail, but just its disorder, its contradictions, its transfigurations, destruction. You see the gable, I mean, the, how then the, ah, the laser pointer, where is it? No, I'm speaking about this kind of exciting moment. Like here or here, tuck, you see? How then it's played with a sort of a moment of disturbance where the tectonic system is sort of put into question. I'm just, I speed up a little, but that, that's the original framing. So we took slides, right? it was Kodachrome at the time. And this is the back of Villa Emo by Palladio. And it's an attempt, <laughs> we're not the first ones to look at these things, and you probably all traveled to Italy and saw it as well. But what's nice then to look at it from the back and to maybe discover a notion of abstraction and reduction, so no ornament. And you could speak of a sort of ideological simplification of architecture by just looking at it that way and discovering maybe something like an almost Adolf Lossian moment in this Palladio facade. Or just I mean, the magics of doublification, just that one object is doubled. And this is totally anonymous. I don't even remember where it exactly uh, this object was. So it's not about the history or the context even. It's just this motif. I go on another <clears throat> back in the front and how then this object is related to the exterior space and the landscape around, the white building behind that beautiful wall. Or very modest, even minor architecture. It's an unknown architect, a small cabin, but in the image that um, you discover the presence of color, obviously. It's the red and the green, probably, and just the two types of windows that are sitting there. And I'm speaking vocabulary. I'm trying to introduce you to a research that was, as I said, personal, but it's accumulation, appropriation of vocab architectural vocabulary. And then in contrast to that, another wonderful Giulio Romano, highly controlled, highly manneristic and grotesque almost. So a very academic piece of architecture, we might say. So there is high and low. And there is accidental masterpieces and very, very um, well-designed ones, you know. And it's the dramatic, the drama of the sort of the, the rustic down here and then going up to this very elegant, sort of almost crazy column carried by this cla very classical tree. The power of a closed wall, almost a kind of Alvaro Cesar-like moment with this window on the left. That's Venice, and other, uh, the other one is Venice too, this is just, I mean, it's the paint, it's the color. Again, it sounds banal, but when it comes to your own design moments, you might remember this, and this could be almost the LA moment, of course. It's Italy because it's very close for us. I mean, we could also travel to Mexico or just stay here and discover things. I was, three weeks ago, I was in Japan for the first time, and you do the same. We discover things, they are always what you see and what you isolate as a sort of a discovery in a way or another is already is related to things that you are already carrying in your mind, I, I, I think. 
This is a, a, a 15th century um, uh, church in Venice. We were especially intrigued and attracted by this, by this just plain marble composition on the wall. Of course, archetypical situation, an island is a building, is a garden. Or just the opulent presence of these golden mosaics in the 1930s and building sort of a, the iconography for a modern king, of course, related to the fascist regime at the time. So this is also Italy, that we see this problematic past and the sort of the continuity of existence of architecture. And with a critical question, to what extent can architecture be independent from that past? But that's maybe a different discourse, but it's to be, to be remembered. Again, it's not about architecture or art history in the first place. It's about making these images. The garden as a building, Villa Imperiale. Look at this. This is a tower or you could say a house probably with one window. I mean, this is modern conceptual art almost. And so on. Huh? You have the real door and the surreal door. Isn't it beautiful? Roman ruins on the side of the forum in Rome and just literally continuity. The new built on top of the old. But at the same time, this is Italy too. And maybe this is even more speaking to us in a way. It's maybe also easier to approach because it's casual. It's the everyday. It's maybe a 1970s or 60s building. But there is a lot of architectural essence. It's the wall, it's proportions, it's the color. Of course, we like the yellow together with this green. And I think it's the coexistence of these different images, of these discoveries of, of a different kind. But to a certain extent, probably archetypical. This is at least something we are interested in, you know? The house, well, maybe not the house, it's more like an infrastructure building. And its context, which is the railway system. But ultimately, an object and even a formal, a formal, let's say the composition of that very, very kind of precariously vertical building is always related to the idea of the city and the space around it all. Ah, there's also a nice one from Bologna. The big order, regular, but almost like the skeleton of a dinosaur. And then behind that regular monumental framework of this of this arcade in the courtyard, you would have the more casual, sort of irregular um, order of the things behind. Building, buildings have physiognomies. They look maybe like animals or they even, it has to do with the roof probably. It has to do with these lodges that it's like maybe a group of animals. <laughs> Or maybe it's the human being. Maybe it's the people living there, you know, so that we cannot fully dissociate buildings from humans. And I think this is another observation. So I'm just offering uh, a series of, of different readings related to form, ultimately, to vocabulary, as I tried to say in the beginning. Architecture as nature or as a transformed form of nature, the, pet the petrification of man in, you see these balls and snails here, so natural forms cast or cut into stone, but also modern elegance and order. It's just a, 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 very, a, a very ordinary waiting area and the stairways in, in a station, I think, in Siena. Making architecture is making order. I think this is a freely, freely translated quote by the Corbusier. Architecture, c'est mettre en ordre. It's just making order. Maybe it has to do with symmetry. It has to do with the hierarchy of elements, the yellow lintel. Again, another Baroque example where the distinction between nature or natural geological form and architectural form is not so sharp anymore. The drama 
of a let's say or the tension of a of a of a of a, comp of a composition that consists of just let's say a boring blank wall, if I simplify a little, so the absence and the presence of of an event of an of a of a spatial occurrence, which is then the densification of these columns. It's a nineteen a nineteen forties building, so the surface and the depth of the space, and so on. So obviously, Italy is a special case. Again, it's not the only. It's not the there are many options for all of us, and we continue to do to make these journeys and these travels. And I still believe um, traveling and taking pictures is is uh, fundamental. But of course, Italy, and I like that slightly weird and maybe strange photograph. Italy, the rich culture of different architectures. I mean, you could say literally a compilation uh, of different architectures. And you see, I mean. Look at this gate here, with the gable, split pediment. Then we see this rather abstract, beautiful facade, another kind of lantern building, and so on. Eh? It's like a huge wedding cake. It's actually the back of the, of the Vatican in Rome. Here you see a little bit of Michelangelo even. But it's not about the authors in the first place. I think it's really about the presence and the, the sort of um, um, uh, even even kind of disturbing presence of different different forms of architecture and studying and understanding the essence of the architectural is the exercise that comes with an image like that. But as I tried to to say before, understanding architecture ultimately means to understand the human being. And this is probably never fully possible. At least this would lead us to a more philosophical discourse. Therefore, also architecture, to a certain extent at least will always remain mysterious to us. Its complexity is not easy to be uh, broken down into simple elements. And I think this is also a lesson. That's why I'm referring to form or bits and pieces of composition. We cannot logically reproduce architecture from fully composing it. We have to sort of reactivate images, probably, that have to do um, with, I think, the complexity of, of, of our existence, actually. But however, it's exactly this constant effort hmm, that is actually made or taken again and again by, by every generation. This is what makes the encounter with historic architecture so fruitful and inspiring. It's, it's not about writing the right um, version of history. It's the amazing thing that architecture is so complex and so rich and in a way so unclear that all of us, I mean, our, our, I don't know, 10 generations before, the next generations to come, they would go there and stand in front of that and again discover something and make something out of it. At least that's how I understand it. And this is um, what brings me back to the title and also uh, that lesson of the introduction, looking at architecture, producing images and activating architecture, historic architecture, appropriated with your own means. This is what we also uh, are doing with our students. This is guiding our teaching as well. Um, so in our design studio, that is a second insight that I would like to give here in the context of, of, your, of your school. Um, in our design studio that we currently call, or last fall at ETH, we called it Ideal Architecture, hence the title. So in that studio, we try to bring our students to the point where they develop and find their own ideal architecture. In other words, a new idea of form, body, and space. Very basic. And in order to clarify or illustrate, rather, this interest or approach to architectural teaching and to architecture in general. Uh, so our position, if I may say, in order to illustrate that a little, I would like to show you now a series of images. You see, they are taken from that studio. That's the outcome, or just a selection. Some few images um, that uh, we took from our teaching at ETH. So 
It's actually undergraduate students in their third semester of architectural studies. They produced uh, along a, a series of different design steps. They produced images like that. We started by studying examples, so existing buildings, namely. Uh, and in case of that studio that you see here, um, there were buildings from Milan. So, in a way, pictures from Italy again. Uh, and in the first step, the students had to make a portrait of the building, a survey, if you want. And then in the second step, an interpretation, and that's what you see here, for instance. The modernist building, very strong structure, cantilevered, reinterpreted, focused on, a, on the aspect of how then this object that almost looks like an animal or so is, is balancing its weight on the ground. So it was about finding fundamental principles of architecture. So out of these examples, the students would create new structures, maybe just uh, a work on a series, an interpretation of light and shadow. What is interesting and what's fundamental, students, we, as a group of students at the studio, we are creating new architecture out of old architecture, if I can put it that way. And this process, by the way, we could call it tradition or tradition and transformation. If you look at tradition as a very, as a very, um, let's say, vital and uh, active process. Very subtle in, uh, interventions. You see the beautiful blueprint and then the students were obsessed with uh, the tension between the order that you would read in the load-bearing system and the walls and in the slight shift of the facade behind it. So, it's the tensionful difference between load-bearing system and space that was investigated and taken as a principle, as an idea. Variations on volumetric compositions. And always designing means drawing, or making a drawing is an act of design. This is a church by Bramante, so there is not much design yet. It's more a selection or, uh, or an example from the, from the portrait. And what I think, or what we tell the students, when you make a drawing, and as long as you don't build it as a building, it's building on paper. This is your reality. So <clears throat> the question of colors, of shadow, is actually your building material. And that's something we are also trying to explore with our students. It's not something that we've always done at the moment. Um, we give a lot, we pay a lot of attention to the way this architectural idea is presented. The notion of space. And you know, no wonder uh, I was very happy to hear that Mizotsaki got the Pritzker the Prize, because I mean, it's a bit looking back at Piranesi maybe first, and to the whole Beaux-Arts tradition. So a section that is revealing space. We have light and shadow in the drawing, but then of course we have the tradition of the Italians. But that's not, not, that's not all of it go to Japan, see Izotaki, and, it's, and, and so on, and also in the US. We are trying to re-elaborate a bit uh, on, on the quality of these drawings. And so on, this is a sort of urban intervention based on a megastructure. Its precedent is somewhere um, related to a football stadium in Milan. Typological um, reinterpretations of a hardcore mass housing block. It's a, the ratio of mass, light, and shadow, which ultimately is even not just for poetic descriptions in architecture, it's, it's the very basics for housing. It's the economy, or it's the economy of means when it comes to, to floor area. Uh, light and shadow, look, at, it, look at, the, at the beautiful drawing. So sometimes we don't know exactly what we're doing, but we're just producing a wonderful drawing and we discover maybe the the content and the intention even of our own design while making and producing the drawing. Constellations, different geometries, it's a site plan, a reinterpretation of, of an industrial ruin by a group of students. Quite speculative 
implications of famous examples in Milan. I told you so. That's the Torre Velasca that you might see behind there. And this is a beautiful drawing. So it's about order, ordering geometry, inventing new types of organization of space, light and shadow again, exploring the potential of representation. This is just black paint, it's nothing else. I mean, or it's just black and white drawings, and it's so spatial. I find that a discovery. It's not so closely related, perhaps, to the, op to the observation on site, but still, it is sort of provoked by this experience of looking at examples. So, what you saw is a selection of a catalog of architectural ideas. We could also call them ideal forms, also very small ones with a big shadow. But obviously, ideal architecture is just the first half of architecture. We're all aware of that. Our ideas, our ideals are to be confronted with the reality of the world, of course. So real architecture is confronting, or our ideal architecture is confronted to the reality of a program, of a client, of the site, and so forth. And um, in that sense, the term of real architecture comprises this confrontation of a, let's say, ideal, timeless, purely architectural, formal intention, perhaps, a dream of a space, a moment of composition, an obsession with geometry. And I think this is very true, whether we speak 21st century or 14th century, doesn't matter. There is the ambition for form, always. But at the same time, there is resistance. And that's where it's getting really interesting. And real architecture, which also have, could have been the title of the lecture, by the way, is where these two things come together. So um, the work in our office, and that's probably the difference to the academic studio, is um, real architecture based on ideal architecture, if I may say. I'll show you now um, uh, in this third part um, some few examples of real architecture, how we conceive and build it in our office. You will see drawings. Since I told you this is also the obsession of the moment to cultivate and even recultivate your, 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 your designs by redrawing. And um, this is an, uh, a series of, of um, uh, drawings that you will see that um, are also a sort of a reaction to the investigation with the students. It's a sort of a blueprint on a, on a beige backdrop. It is a high-tech laboratory building in a, in a hilly landscape in a valley in Switzerland. You see this is the entrance door and that's the other end. We look at the plan. We would enter from here, we see three boxes that give sort of the rhythm and the size of these five different sections. So it is a building for a microtechnology company, small. And what is probably interesting or what was a sort of a, a need for invention in terms of type and organization of space was that on the one hand, it is for offices, workshops, presentations, seminars, meeting, open plan, and on the other hand, from this side, it is like three containers for testing, testing their technology, where they would build models and work on polymers, so where potentially things could even explode. So um, it was interesting to combine two sort of hostile combination, or one a hostile neighbor to the other. Anyway, so this is the entrance. And the drawing is something between a technical representation, very close to the construction of the building um, specifications, and something that is maybe even more a portrait of the building. So take this series of drawings 
as a sort of an in-between reality between uh, the reality of building and um, the conception of an idea. It's an attempt of expressing this existence of architecture between the two poles, between real and ideal, or the other way around. And then you see the three bays where they would open and, and install their testing, uh, testing uh, installation, a meeting room up here. And it plays with a simple image of a factory. So it is sort of the children's drawing of an industrial building that we are trying also to recall properly. And in section, you see double height relation of these bays and laboratories and workshops in the, in the lower part. In longitudinal section, we understand it's sitting on a slope. Here, the human being, the people would come in and sit here on the dad roof with the shed. And here, the lorry, the truck, and the machinery would enter the building. Drawings between technical drawings and almost landscape painting. This is rather the technical version. You see the three concrete base containers, and then just the steel work. This is the drawing. And I try to describe you what we do. And you will be a bit disappointed, I'm afraid, but you don't see much images, uh, photographs. <laughs> that You saw them from Italy. Now you see, get just a very uh, kind of um, strict, um, restricted selection. Anyway, all the photographs are taken by Stefano Graziani, who is an Italian photographer and, and artist with whom we work on quite a, many projects. And he did a recent also reshooting of some of the work. Uh, for, for actually an, an exhibition that we had, as I, as I told you, uh, in, in Japan. And, and he also went to the archives and looked at the working models. So that's not necessarily um, models to sell it to the client. We are mainly work making these models for ourselves. So yes, there is the drawing and the memory of pictures and ideas, as we now understand. But there is also the model, of course. And here you get a sense of this kind of little metal factory and you see the another working model of the entrance where everything is very congested and you understand that there is the reflection of the metal and then sort of brushed onto this raw aluminium as we imagined it four letters which is the name of the company so depending on how you look you see it or you don't so it was the attempt of incorporating the the, the brand or the, the, yeah, the name of the company and then that's how it looks <laughs> surreal kind of context that's Swiss suburban slash rural idyllic um, landscape but there is actually more factory building down here and here you see this kind of awkward plot on the corner if we go close and I didn't promise too much you don't see much <laughs> it's just the raw aluminum panel the corrugated on the roof that's basically it it's made out of of the material, they would also make a good part of the machinery, a certain analogy between the, the function of the building and its expression. And when we go to the interior, we would see the industrial roof. That's the meeting area with a curtain that gives a certain uh, a privacy to be part of it. And we see, obviously, a formal compositional quality of analogy between roof and textile. And another view, and if you look carefully, in the reflection mirrors here in the, in the windows or in the glass screen, you would see a circular window. It's not the Gordon Mother Clark one in that case, but it's here. And you look from the office area into these um, testing bays. So, and the rest is imagination. Second project. Um, it's an office building, linear building, three floors for a pharmaceutical company, also in, in Germany, but very close to Basel, where we live and work. So um, mainly Europe, as you can see. Um, simple plan, a series of cores, and then a linear kind of open space with that path. That is sort of the course are offset, meaning that there is something like a head or or a open area at the entrance, 
but not only at the entrance on all the floors, you would have a big lodger. And that's actually almost the idea of the project that we said, oops, that we said um, it is a conventional office, not very big, but we try to give it a sort of an extra a add on, an extension, which is maybe, I don't know, 20% of the floor area, or not even, but it's too big for just the balcony. It's sort of space that might not be needed, but it's important. It's the essence of the building. You could say it's an interpretation on the vocabulary of modernism, pillar and slab. But again, it's not just a repetition. We think of Italy and the composition and the compilation. So the lowest slab is the thinnest, a bit of strange sort of ramp, and then it gets always a bit fatter. So it's not a series. It's more like one object. It's an attempt, at least, to balance this tension between seriality, repetition, and this one object that makes a body. And this is very explicitly shown in that lodger that has also to do with a public sort of plaza on that campus. But there is also construction. And we see, in this case, concrete. We see that, of course, this very basic, almost archetypical presence of the beam or of the slab is in reality ideal, real. It's a load bearing element. This is a beam here, but then there is insulation and then an on site cast um, white concrete element which makes the parapet. Again, oh, sorry, there was a model. <laughs> this actually is not completely true, and this was not a working model, really. We did it sort of with the building. It's made out of concrete and it was so heavy we had to cut it into pieces. So I'm not so sure whether it's extremely elegant or rather the opposite, but we liked it and we reassembled it for Stefano. So here you see the essence and maybe the idea, if I may say. And that's interesting that these models maybe convey the idea and the building is real, obviously. And hopefully the building is delivering a little bit more than just what the model is showing. Here you see it in that strange view onto the sort of the head of the building on that small square in a rather um, strange image because you can't really read it. And here, actually there, you're building a much bigger now building for the same um, uh, campus. And there we get closer to that very forced contrast between the slim, slender black steel column and the and the white concrete, and the entrance on the right. And this is the third project, which is um, an office building, uneven plan. It's right at a railway station, again, in the suburbs of Basel. Maybe it's a, a building that goes maybe 10 years back or so. And what we can also see is actually on a sort of uneven topography, so it's quite an odd um, and, and difficult plot, if I may say, with a public sort of shop window side to the to the bus and, and train station, and then which is two cores, very simple. I, I think that's maybe the nicer drawing where we see just the, the trapezoid of the of the plan and the core and the load bearing series of pillars on the towards the facade. Four stories. And here I think it gets interesting because you see the drama of this little uneven plot. The level difference. And I like the, this drawing very much. It is actually the construction detail of the most difficult corner. It's a pre-fabricated -con um, pre um, concrete element, so we have the two windows, and then part of that concrete frame, um, as you can imagine, uh, something like that. All right, and then a model again, a heavy model. Uh, actually, in the beginning, we wanted to make it out of aluminum, and, um, and we also made the model. It's milled out of massive aluminum, and then the client uh, decided against the aluminum, and we went for prefab concrete. Ah, 
19, typical 1970s sort of belief. And, um, and you see, it is about the seriality, the regularity of the module, and the irregularity of the body, of the, of the volume of the building. So there is again a certain tension, and that's how it looks today. And the concrete is so well, um, <laughs> I should say, or maybe so badly done, that it, is, that it is washed out and it turns silvery and it's getting close to the model again. And I think it's quite um, a, a simple building and I still like it. Uh, it has to do with Italy. I mean, with uh, no false modesty, we could speak of the palazzo. We can speak about the physical presence of a building that, that sits on a heavy circle. Uh, uh, but at the same time, this stability and this certainty of architecture is somehow put into question with this kink, with this um, moment of bending and tilting the object. And in the end, I, I guess these half controlled, half uncontrolled moments are important for, for uh, an architectural artifact because you can't just comprehend it and understand it at once. And here I'm speaking about this complex, which is the Swiss National Museum. And there I had a conceptual um, kind of weakness, and I show you a, a few pictures more. I hope you forgive me, but um, anyway, I start with the drawings again. Um, uh, late 19th century building, a composition or a pastigio of different types and, and, and styles of architecture, a tower, a palace, sort of a cathedral, train station-like building, which makes me think of the Notre Dame, sorry, it has nothing to do with this architecture, but uh, still, I guess we all noticed, it's, um, I'm still a bit under shock, but that's just a side note. Um, Anyway, so this is um, this is this existing building to be renovated and, re and and refurbished, and an extension, a new wing, on the park. That's a huge, no, not huge, but a kind of an elongated park, elongated park between two rivers. So it's quite an interesting site in Zurich. It looks idyllic, park, castle, but in fact, here is right here is the main train station. So the most, the the, the most. Um, um, most most in, intensively used um, public transport hub of Switzerland is actually just next door. So it was about about extending this this existing very fragile listed building. Of course, so it's about heritage. It's about the relationship old and new and new. Vonne was talking about that. So the importance of context, the the question, the problem of how we deal with the existence with what's handed down to our generation is, of course, the big thing in Europe especially. I think it's for all of us, speaking of resources, understanding that the cycle and the speed of, of um, renovation and renewal uh, will change or has to change, I believe. I mean, again, I'm thinking of a city like Los Angeles or Tokyo or all these me mega cities where you could see that the life cycle of a building is maybe around, I don't know, between 20, 30 and 50 years, meaning that in a lifetime, more or less, you would, you would um, witness the complete rebuilding of a, of a whole metropolis of 10 or 50, 40 million people. And if we start to, extra, uh, 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 to extrapolate this into the future, with our, with our and our kids' um, 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 life expectation, it's, it's just, I mean, it, it won't work anymore. But that's kind of common sense. So, renovation, reuse, additions, extensions, reinterpretations is something that is, I think, counts for everyone everywhere. So it's not to do with history or cultural value necessarily. In that case, obviously, it's a bit, of, it's even more, more so. Okay, back to the project. Um, the entrance was here, in that kind of corner there. Now the entrance is there. That's a historic part. It was um, originally a different section of the museum. It was sort of a dead end and you had to go back. And here now is the new entrance, restaurants, foyer, 
and then you would entrance hall lobby and then you go into the new wing that is kind of an awkward form as you do that we have big protective trees here and it sort of makes the movement takes the movement from that one side and it goes out into the park and reconnects here here is a big sort of tunnel or um, uh, overpass so the park and the courtyard system would be connected but still of course then um, you would you would go on and close the circuit so it's a symbolic gesture but it's also a very concrete and real thing which is a typological one that now the, the, the parkour would go the circuit through old and new making one whole so it's a, a whole story about also the dialogue of these two things how they interact how this can possibly belong to the old one that is a very manneristic sort of historicist um, collection of architectures and then this kind of new building it's a bit of a dinosaur or a monster you don't know really it is not there's no style or a formal language in that in that sense but it's the attempt of relating in plan and in section the new element to the conditions of the existence and um, I'm always tempted to speak of a sort of a contextual counterpiece because on the one hand it, it's only um, described or informed by the context of the park the trees the geometry of the site and the sort of up and down movements the skyline of the roofs and at the same time it's confronting the exist the existing building the old um, uh, idea of the, of the place and of the museum with a quite radical and probably almost brutal gesture if, if you will and then we have a detail looking at the windows that are just punched holes drilled into the concrete actually true and it was cast on site and then drilled uh, the engineers found out that this was easier than doing formwork the whole truth is it's true for the outer wall they literally drilled one point uh, it's crazy and and formwork in the interior anyway so that's kind of it's primitive but also very sophisticated and then that object I'm speaking now about the new wing the different faces of that complicated geometry um, being controlled with the design the drawing of the formwork I like this drawing it's an unfolded part for start you see this type of openings or apertures probably in the US yeah? and then we have here a fenêtre en longueur for the typical modern window for the library and for the rest different levels of auditorium exhibition halls under the roof sort of a one continuous exhibition space changing exhibition and curators they don't want any light it's not an art museum it's a history museum or art and craft a, a cultural history museum so it's a lot has a lot to do with scenography and um, installations so the building is actually rather giving a sort of and the space for it like a theater stage probably and that's how it looks then we see the concrete we see the two types of openings and we see different levels of concreteness if I may say and abstraction here we can probably identify elements of a traditional building that goes with elements like the roof the pitched roof the windows a bit like a fortress here and then just of course the beauty of the concrete that is a very specially made concrete which yeah, I, I don't tell the story I'm already five minutes over time so um, anyway so and that's in the view from the library onto a part of the park and the river the city around it and then the, the view back onto this object that is a bit like an elephant behind the trees and then you see that overpass or the bridge and the connection into the courtyard reflection of the, of, of the water so it is recalling probably a negative form of a mountain or a pyramid it is also that these concrete structures have something to do with Swiss tradition of engineering I mean Swiss buildings are, are not necessarily very monumental Swiss tend to 
try to be uh, invisible, especially when it comes to public representation. And the most um, courageous and spectacular buildings, you would find them maybe in the mountains, dams, fortifications, power plants, you know, buildings of infrastructure. And in a way, um, this object is also trying to relate to that tradition. And here we see it then, you remember the plan, the relationship between old and new, the space that is created between the two. And we have another wonderful um, picture by Stefano Graziani from the archive, where he found these funny objects that were exploring the logic, the geometry of this sort of accidental sculptural object that was created by the constraints or the conditions of the site and, and the place. And this is what ultimately makes the quality of a project. It's the space, it is the relationship, it is this sort of almost romantic moment of a little town where you would discover the tension and the actual physical quality of this encounter. The new is looking at the, at the past, the present is looking at the past. It's, of course, full of symbolism, if you will. And that's the interior. That's, I think, a section of the auditorium. I was speaking of a sort of a raw spaces, kind of a theater stage for all sorts of interpretations of uh, exhibitions. Continuative space. You saw the bridge, the overpass. The price that you pay is a monumental stairs that we love. I also learned in the meantime it's almost politically incorrect to propose such an important stairs because obviously there is people who have difficulty to walk on these stairs. And I'm saying this also seriously. So maybe one of the most beautiful means of architecture still in a public building, the public stairs, is something um, to be questioned perhaps. Here we liked it as a performance space that is also used for exhibition as a sort of a moment of interaction where through the window you would see, look at the old buildings. That's the small version of it for the auditorium, that's the back of the auditorium. So the external form is creating the inner space. It's basically just the concrete wall. We remember the office building. And a very technical ceiling that we like to display. Of course, it's not always that much on display, and it's very well ordered and to be precise, but still it's the, it's the directness of these architectural features, concrete wall and that ceiling, the roof and that thing. Okay. Um, moving on to this small tower block, offices and housing. What is special with this project is it stands on a train station here is the train, the railways. Heavy, heavy traffic because it's the whole north south corridor from Germany, blah, 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 from the north to the south. All the cargo goes through here. So, not so obvious to live here because, um, um, especially when it comes to noise, it, Switzerland has very, very heavy regulations. You, you, in order to offer a housing, an apartment, you must guarantee that you can open the window and without any technical means, or we're not speaking air conditioning or anything, just open the window and you measure the noise and that's nat called natural ventilation with acceptable noise level. So that means it's quite tricky. And what we, I'm, I'm saying that because real architecture. <laughs> there is the, no, no, but it's, it's, it's the, in the end, that's also what is our profession, that we, luckily, we are not artists. We are not creating our problems uh, ourselves only. We, of course, we have to make choices about how do we want to, or how much priority, how much weight and importance that we give to a problem. But we are exposed to that reality, and I think this is fundamental. At the same time, there is ideal aspect. I mean, there is geometry. There is a will for control and beauty. In that case, we were very interested in creating a symmetrical building, making that sort of gesture towards that small public square. So it, the drawings, and that's maybe a default of that drawing, is, um, is making quite a bit of abstraction of this urban context. So it's very focused on the object. But the height of these wings, the gesture the, 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 of, of that, of these two arms, are closely related or have to do with the site. And then the shaft with the, with the, with the floors of the houses. Yeah? And you can guess or maybe understand this is a rhomboid form, symmetrical. 
twice a triangle, and then again two more triangles. So there is a very severe, sort of almost obsessive control of geometry within that plan. Uh, on the ground floor, you would have the two canopies, so you walk under here or here. This is the entrance for the office, that for the housing. Typological clarity. And then on the upper floors, looking onto these two wings, we have the runway plan with an off-centered core for the tower. And then the apartments all looking into this direction. Because from that angle on here, this facade is offering that noise protection, the shadow from the noise. So the, uh, no, uh, from the noise. So you understand that the, the the logic of the geometry has to do with the sort of physical um, problem of, of of noise, and that's in the section. And interesting on this on on the protected side where the where the apartments would open, we have we have the regular um, windows and towards the noise. They are kind of closing down, so this is not to be opened. The building is showing this sort of, you know, um, almost aggression from the forces of the site, and that's the object, uh, the, the model. Making architecture is making order. It's trying to impose a certain architect and uh, typological and geometrical rigor, and that's how it's then built. It's guided by gal uh, it's galvanized steel. The skin. It's actually the first high rise, or I mean, forgive me, it's for Swiss terms, it's higher rise, but it's a 20 story building with a, with a wooden timber construction facade and then protected against the weather but also against fire with this um, galvanized steel that will, um, of course, weather and, 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 and have a patina. So it has to do with the site, it's an industrial site, it has to do with the ambivalence or the ambiguity of that material. And being transformed over time. And that's maybe the most delicate moment in the composition when you see the ground floor and then the first counter movement where the different, the different geometrical elements are being combined and then in an apartment. The view to the landscape, the view to the sun and the protected openable area. And that's how it stands there. All right, there's one more, maybe two. This is the Kunstmuseum exhibition gallery building that we added to the existing Kunstmuseum in Basel, uh, the, the town where we live and, and, and work. It's a, it, not such a big building, sitting on a, on a like a cornerstone here on a, on a, on a crossroad, there is a, a bridge and and the river. And this building from 1930s hosts one of the most important um, painting galleries in the uh, painting collections in the world, I think, for Western European paintings. And it was about making an addition to that across the street, which is not an easy thing. So to that sort of 1930s building, which is a quite a beautiful museum, making clearly reference to the tradition of Italian Renaissance, there was a sort of another palazzo to be added. At least that was our interpretation. The brief was clearly asking for something that is quite atypical for, for the times we live in, meaning a new museum building that is not mainly about the VIP rooms and the member rooms and the coffee shop and the, and the bookshop, which is all fine, no? But it was really about galleries and almost nothing else, which is a sort of a hardcore museum. Plus, it was asked for a sort of a traditional gallery, sort of more of the same. And I have to admit, we liked the idea to make a, kind of a radical sort of contemporary version of, uh, of a contemporary museum, as we called it. But this is not, not um, so obvious, because I always observe and I, I, I perfectly understand that, especially in the art, in the art uh, world, architecture is also a sort of a, uh, an element of rhetorics. And the rhetorics of, of museums go towards openness and flexibility, not only because it's practical, very often it's not practical, but the idea of flexibility and openness is of course, um, uh, culturally speaking, ideologically speaking, um, a, ve a, very, a very important one. You know? So what happens if you do um, conceive a museum 
that is going back to massive walls, clearly defined and committed spaces that you would not change. And that's what we try to do here. And you see this. That's the entrance of the new building. There's an underground connection. That's the ground floor. I skip it. I show you the main floor plan. This is three times repeated. So it's actually a very compact building. Not much space, not much air. We have two, two sections with galleries. The rectangular shaped rooms are the galleries. We have like one section here and another one there. So it's like two houses within one building. Has to directly to do with the, with the geometry of the site. Here's the river, that's the historic road that already in the Middle Ages is sort of forming here. That's a more modern street from the 1910s, I think. Anyhow, the two, the, the two units sit parallel to these respective streets. And then there's another gesture, just folding in the plan, creating a little bit of a sort of a small space before you enter the building. And then the remaining kind of difference between inside and outside form shape is used for, for technical uh, cores and others. And in the center, between the two boxes, there is the main staircase. Again, huge stairs. You see the section more technically displayed. This, 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 these four floors are the public gallery floors. You see a system of variations of explicitly tectonic tectonic um, prefab concrete tectonics beams panels and skylights on the top and we also can see in this beautiful drawing that there is different uh, many many layers of bricks different type of bricks and here we see the context we see the importance of uh, the surrounding buildings the history of the place so I think this is a very programmatic representation in that sense, that we try to understand the museum also on an institutional level as being part of the civic society, at least for that case here. It's one of the oldest, probably, yeah, one of the oldest public collections of art in the world, meaning it was not an emperor or a prince or a king or aristocracy. No, it was from the 16th or early 17th century on. It was a privately owned um, uh, um, collection in the very beginning, then donated to the city, the citizens of Basel. Anyway, so that's the museum being one out of a series of buildings constituting the community of buildings and of the civic society. And I think this is a symbolic drawing for the role of the museum. It's not the iconic star, superstar architecture that is um, there to mainly exist on Instagram. Bricks. With some special feature, you see this sort of cutout, and there here you could guess is strips of F LED LED lights. As you see in this enigmatic drawing, layers of brick, elect electric cables that are bringing light to a portion of that brick wall that we will see maybe in a minute. The urban situation, old and new, it's acting in a historic context. And here we see it in real, actually from the back. I'm sorry, but as you see, we, we see the casual sort of encounter with pre-existing structures. And in the back of that building, the layers of brick, the frieze, that is just an indication of an architectural order. A few windows, and that's the front. Galvanized steel, by the way, here. The door, three different um, type of brick, different gray. And then that frieze that is measuring actually the daylight on the on the on the it's quite, quite sophisticated piece of, of sort of um, building technology. Uh, I like to say it's sort of the digital age is leaving a little imprint on that Roman uh, wall. So it is kind of very uh, basics, archaic on the one hand, and of course I guess quite sophisticated and very contemporary on the other. And here we have then the possibility to display and. Uh, and to sort of communicate in addition to the basic structure of the building. In the interior, a shot of, of the staircase, Italian marble. So um, I don't know whether this has to do with the first part of my lecture. It's stucco, very gray in, in, in this, in this um, staircase. And then when you come to the gallery, classic 
1950s on and has an extreme important um, collection, Barnett Newman and so on. But I mean, what you see is that the structure, you remember the load bearing walls in the plan, the two boxes with the cross, the twice four rooms. It is reappearing in the expression. It's modest, but it's also very present and it's very precise. From one room to the other, there is a threshold. There is a sort of recalling the structure, the typological figure of the plan with a gray marble threshold, the load bearing wall, and then in a very explicit articulation, we would have a massive plasterboard wall that stands in front of it that is dedicated to the display of art. And in the end, it's these subtle moments where we can then sort of celebrate uh, this articulation. And I think there, there is a lot of care and awareness for these things in a project like this one. And this is the last image of this project. It's transition in the old part of the building where you would then go to the entrance of the new. You see that our interventions, the sort of the gray stone and stucco is directly related to what we found actually um, on site. Ah, it was a lie, it was not the last one, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but that's a, just a quick one. Uh, it's a housing for a, for a community um, living of, uh, for people um, with, a, with a mental disease. It's, so it's a, it's a community project with a workshop actually and then the house on the street, entrance to the courtyard. And what we like is to explore sort of the beauty of plants that speak about a certain irregularity. It's a series of, I think, seven rooms and, a, com and, and, a, and a, a, a shared kitchen. Every room is slightly different, so kind of giving expression uh, to the individuality of the people. And um, it's an exercise in classical um, um, live, uh, traditional housing types in Switzerland, or in that, in that context, this is a section. And I like these simple elevations because we see order, we see rigor, and still there's a little bit of a play. So it's this, this tension between order and disorder, which of course is a very simple, a bit too simple image of the human condition. Lodger on that side. Silver, silver paint on a, on a very rough stucco, cheap construction. almost sort of, in that case, the celebration of the banal. And here is the building as it then stands in the, in, the, in the line of the, making this sort of small but strong uh, presence to the street with that, with that sort of very vertical facade. Ah, and then um, very last, uh, so that's a working model and it has to do with this other model, which is, I'm speaking about that box. But this is something, there's no drawings yet because um, this is under construction. So there are construction drawings, of course, but no blueprint drawings. It's a box on an industrial site. This is a chocolate factory. And there is a lake here. It's out of Zurich and again in Switzerland. So Swiss chocolate, you would go in here and then um, explore a world of chocolate, which is a chocolate museum. You, it's a chocolate factory where you can see um, how chocolate is made. It's a half an industrial building and it's half a, a sort of a commercial building. It's maybe something like a chocolate mall or so. And, um, but it's architecture at the same time, obviously. So um, we have columns and stairways and lifts and skylights. It's a bit of a clumsy model. Uh, it's very honest. I think it's um, important that you see that. That's how, how we um, work. Still, uh, 21st century. I feel a bit um, embarrassed, but anyway. So this is the photograph of a section of that working model. It has to do with the interest in the monumentalization of the structure. So going back to the again same and same um, topics of architecture, that would also take us back to ancient Greece or, 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 or Italy. And that's how it looks at the, no, that's maybe a couple of months back now. But um, that's then the space that is created with these columns. It's a box and an atrium in the center. That's basically what it is with three um, public floor. And the box is just a, a load bearing wall. And then we have, I think, eight big columns that make the atrium and four big skylights. And um, 
So it's an industrial kind of a factory-like space, but at the same time, it's, I don't know, I'm hesitating to say it's a, it's a cathedral of chocolate, but I don't know. But anyway, it's, a, it's monumental to a certain extent, uh, and I'm, I also like it. And I think it's also important that, uh, that the architecture is, is, is reaching that moment of monumentality and the sort of the strong and spatial and kind of moving quality. Huh? And there are bridges, and you come up, and then here is the museum, and on the other side they are producing chocolate, so you make a kind of a circuit here. However, this is not that important. We, we like the, the idea of an analogy of being processed, like the ingredients, maybe, <laughs> of chocolate, where you have these sort of um, kind of movements, no? and, and turning in circles, and actually the circle has to do with, with, uh, with that logic of, of making the, the, right, the right mix of the chocolate, but that's maybe more anecdotic, what we liked is that the movement of the people and the movement of uh, industrial production is informing the architecture itself and is then of, at the same time making reference maybe to, to very classical motifs of the column and the capital. From the outside, this is a rendering. You could say it's a cheesy rendering, yeah, but um, uh, I think it shows nicely that the, the old buildings of the factory, it's red brick, white glazed brick, sort of a screen, but massive. It's a monolithic construction with this big entrance. That's um, what you see when you come to that site. So it is sort of a partly hidden building. It's pragmatic, it's very real, but there is a moment of, let's say, um, elegance and representation. And then um, since I introduced myself with the pictures from Italy, um, I couldn't resist. Anyway, <laughs> I mean, that's maybe a very modest conclusion. However, uh, mirroring uh, the great, the, the great images of, of our architectural history. Anyway, so I, I think this is the last pictures taking you up to this highlight. Obviously, in a very beautiful state of the the base build. Uh, I think we all like that because at least when the architecture is so much building literally on the on the effect of that of that um, primary element presence of the structure, understanding that this is not always the case. But anyway, the image, the idea of architecture as the elementary phenomenon of tectonics is part of that dream, maybe related to where I come from. So the presence of material mass, light and shadow, but of course made for the people to inhabit it. It's a machine, a machinery for life. Here, show that a moment of transition still in the making. But ultimately, architecture is architecture. It's ideal and real at the same time. Thank you very much. I'm sorry, I, it was 45 minutes and 15 minutes questions and answers. I, I have time, I came for this lecture, so please. Um, uh, uh, and then there's also a dinner, and I think, um, but um, do you have questions or comments? Um, or are you exhausted? I will, I, will, I will start it off if nobody has a question for you. Uh, I will ignore the last project because I'm from Belgium and I believe in Belgian chocolate and cathedrals should be built for Belgian chocolate and not Swiss <laughs> chocolate. But I would like to go back to, to when you were do, talking about the extension to the museum in Zurich. And you said like uh, Swiss architecture tends to want to disappear. Uh, and in this case, or, or in our public buildings, there's a sort of presence and a sort of, sort of, a sort of relation to the city, to the cityscape. Um, and and now I was now looking at the last housing project, which is extremely harsh, and it's extremely. Um, I mean, you, you chose and again, kind of a rough stucco facade, uh, and of course so there's a lot of quality. We can see the interior spaces and about the in, in individuality of the rooms. But what, what, um, what could the ambition be for you for a building which is housing, which is basically kind of generic? Uh, uh, housing uh, of, of, of the city? Is, is there some kind of contribution it can make to public space? Or is there sort of, you have to say now, you just have to accept the fact that they are there to kind of fill in uh, 
mass phase of um, Actually, the, the project, this is the house, and then there's a workshop building that I didn't show, but that, uh, that's sort of sitting in this courtyard. I think probably extremely harsh in the sense it is, it is um, holding back in a way. It's, it's, it's trying to, to express the notion of uh, anonymity, which goes, uh, at least in, 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 for certain contexts, um, goes very well with the idea of urban architecture, I think. So it's uh, maybe totally different from a LA type of, no, no, but um, is that, that I believe uh, an urban building has to hold back to a certain extent because it, it's not only um, the isolated object as I was maybe um, showing it, but it belongs in the first place to that role. It's all gray buildings in that case. And we like the idea to be, to, to design a building that is a gray, in a way boring building. And then, and there I don't agree with you, is it's quite spectacular and in a way quite generous because different from the typical building that would have maybe a doorway where you just w would walk through a kind of a gate into the courtyard where, t where traditionally you would find then workshops or so. So it's a perimeter block. You have the building in the front, a gate, and you go through the building, closed off, and then you have you find the courtyard with small businesses and a workshop. We, at least we thought, huh, it's kind of a heroic urban gesture to open up, to turn the corner, and to try to establish, and not on the image, but in reality, actually quite well, it works quite well to connect the street to that sort of half public backyard. So in that sense, the building has a lot to do with that moment of exception that we were trying to create. But the, the vocabulary, the language, and also thinking of Italy, you know, and not of a palace or of a church, but of just a very banal, very banal casual sort of anonymous building, we like we like the idea of using a language of which we think it could be understood naturally by everyone. So. It is uh, quite a sophisticated argument trying to speak a language that is sort of not the language of an author. And still then, when you go close, you see a moment of tension, of composition, maybe of, sort of breaking the rule. But that's, that, was, that was, let's say, the idea of the project. Yes? So I, I see, is this on? I feel like um, the beautiful work renderings and the models are amazing. And there's a kind of storybook quality, I think, to the way you've rendered all the buildings in that single style and the manner in which you've shown us the sort of crochet. But, it, but then I think also that there's a kind of trick in your um, foreword and your epilogue to the storybook that you put in the middle. And I wonder if um, the sort of Italian classics was uh, just a kind of, oh, why not show it like this story? Or if you actually think that's the origin story of it, could you actually just put a forward now that you've been here in Los Angeles that looked at a, a series of our kind of, I don't know, throwaway buildings, even the generic buildings of LA, and begin it and end it with that and just tell a slightly different story? Or were those, in fact, somehow specific to the works in between? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe a, a disturbingly elegant answer to the question would be it's both, uh, really. I mean, the, the biographical truth is that the sort of um, uh, our, our also collaborating with someone, huh? I mean, in a very close relationship, a working relationship, has to do even more than probably for an individual designer to do with um, establishing a set of references and, and collecting these images. And it's just a simple truth that the first thing was Italy. Yeah? And it has to do with our education. And also, and this is something I wouldn't give up on, is that, that um, sort of a very profound interest uh, in something that I could describe at as a sort of a casual, everyday classicism that is not academic. Yeah. So in the end, 
it's not the grand uh, uh, argument. So this is something that I relate closely to Italy, but sort of not the big ones, but the sort of the discoveries on the side. Huh? And now to, to the second part, or to, to, to your question. And yes, of course, it is at the same time LA. Because we could walk along many streets, not necessarily in Beverly Hills, where you have then maybe the reference to Italy in a very explicit and maybe not that interesting, but to, to sort of, of um, you know, very kind of very ordinary, I'm tempted to say vulgar um, type of, of, of modest architecture. And I would be able to identify pictures from Italy in LA, you know, in the sense it's, yeah, it's just a wall with two windows. It's about the color and the proportion. Of course, it's not Italy, it's architecture in general. And, and you know, and also this is the other part of the bio, uh, biographical truth. Since Italy, and I didn't show it for time reasons, <laughs> I mean, we, we then went on. Our interest in anonymous architecture increased, and we did a, a six-year research where we went to Buenos Aires, to Hong Kong, to New Delhi, to Sao Paulo, but also to Manhattan or to Paris, to Rome even, but not the classical Rome, the antique Rome, but Rome of the 20th century. So we were looking at, at big cities or even metropolises that were mainly built in the 20th century. And, and we were looking at sort of the big mass. And um, some of it also designed by good architects, some of it may be rather anonymous. So our, our journey our taking pictures went on uh, and we described that then as a sort of a collection of types. We called it typology, which is of course making reference to a very big tradition architecture that goes back into the 18th century as a theoretical term. But we used it in a very similar manner as a sort of a repertoire, as a collection of images and ideas. And in that sense, of course, uh, it is not just Italy. And to come to back to your question, I could have introduced it with Sao Paulo and ended maybe with New Delhi. Why not? But, um, but I think the meta story of looking at examples, as banal as it sounds, and making architecture out of architecture, by remembering architecture, and, and by, trying, by trying to make your own statement that is related to something, uh, this is what, I'm, what, what we are doing. And I'm not saying it's the only way, of course not. I mean, there is an obsession with newness. There is a tradition of avant-garde that is trying to create and produce form that is unseen, that has no precedent. And this is maybe the counter story to ours. Yeah, me again. Uh, but uh, one way or another, it, I find it, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's very interesting the way, the way I, I, I start to discover your work now differently. Uh, and it, one way or another, reminds me a little bit of you never speak of your work as a sort of uh, artistic endeavor. But one way or another, it reminds me very much, and I kind of realized that you started up your practice in 98. For me, there was a sort of moment in the contemporary arts where artists all of a sudden had this uh, very the discovery of the, of the, of the, of the quotidian, uh, when uh, all of a sudden uh, people like uh, also, also Gabriela Orozco we talked about today in, in uh, uh, start developing his work, where all of a sudden, uh, uh, what is the, the Swiss? Um, Fischlin Weiss. Fischlin Weiss started taking all these pictures of their daily trips, of the, the pictures out of the window, of the seats they were using. And one way or another, there's this kind of poetry. And, 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 and in, in, for example, for me, the, the, what I said, the harshness of this gray stucco, but just not painting it gray, but painting it silver. That's for me, that same kind of poetry. And if I would now all of a sudden re-describe your, your work as a sort of uh, uh, artistic uh, project that kind of plays with that, that kind of poetic notion of the discovery of, of, uh, of uh, daily life or like, uh, mm -hmm. is that something you, 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 you would feel uh, comfortable with? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> sure. Uh, uh. Again, uh, that's what I was trying with maybe uh, many words, but what I was saying, this is, that's the findings on an Italian journey. That's these kind of everyday things, you know, it's, it's the gas station on the highway. It's this kind of shitty shed somewhere, you know, where you find more beauty than in looking at Palazzo Ruccellai or no, no, you know, I mean, this is of course the, the sort of the exercise we're all doing. Uh, we have to sort of find our own, our own discoveries. And um, 
and the everyday and the casual, even sometimes the charmingly grotesque of of a, of a, of a as found situation, is of course very close to us. And um, and it, it it's of course this as well. And and by the way, I mean, yeah, we're speaking of the 90s, but architecture is always uh, at least 20 years behind the art. <laughs> and 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 I mean, of, of course, you could look of pop art, and then you would speaking of Orozco and Fish and Vice being like a second generation of a of a different of a different take on that ordinary everyday. It's not the pop art as a sort of a typical a typical um, description of, of I think typical forms and objects and language, but rather personal personal take on the ordinary. I think this is um, what makes Orozco. It's him finding trash on the street, uh, a kind of uh, old football, you know, and making it an art piece in a way. His personal discovery. It's fish and lies with the eyes of children almost uh, discovering the the beauty of the of the banal every day and uh, and uh, I think it's a nice observation I'm, I'm and it's also true by the way that we collaborated with Peter Fishley on the Kunstmuseum uh, I mean collaborated is a big word he was he was not, he's not he was a sort of a he's a friend and we exchanged on on the idea of what a museum and an exhibition space could be. Discussing it in terms of the quotidian or every day is under uh, revealing its scenography. So, like when you look at this drawing, what what interests me is the way in which the uh, order is uh, something that the eye, like the mind in perception, makes it look much more ordered than it is. It in fact is is carefully um, uh, staging disorder and kind of uh, imprecision. And so the kind of tension between the things not aligning, like there's a complete rejection of datums, but, but uh, visually it operates to kind of reproduce order, even though at close study it kind of Flips around and never quite snaps. You know, no, no O snaps on in your office, and and then the so it's playing both sides of that. And I think the perceptual gain is incredibly important and and not discussed as much as as it operates. And so I think it's easy to say to the students, I like the every day and I'm, I'm sort of borrowing from the every day, but the amount of sonography and craft that goes into producing this admixture of the every day and a kind of scholarship about uh, order is a really wonderful thing mm -hmm. to see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, thank you. No, no question, no, comment no, no, but, only. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't feel any need to object or something. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's highly, it's, in the end, it's highly designed. Huh? Yeah. And, uh, and, but design means care and attention and densification, ideally, I think. I think that's it. Huh? Thank you. Thank you.